what we're going to talk about today, data is a shadow. And we're going to shed some light on the world beyond metrics. Just right at the top, I'm going to say, as a previous data scientist, I love data and I love using data. So I'm not here to completely slag off data. Um, but I think it is important that we consider the other side of what's happening with our users and our products and our customers. So let's jump in. Um, just a very quick word about me. Say my name is Harrison Gilmore. Um, I spent five years at Skyscanner working in a load of things, um, the experimentation platform, growth strategy and data acquisition where I shifted into product management. Spent 18 months at Care Sourcer here in Edinburgh. They're doing an incredible amount of work to solve a really difficult problem about making it much easier and straightforward to find elderly care for your loved ones in a incredibly worthwhile but difficult place to work in. They're doing great work. Uh, and earlier this year in April, just as lockdown kicked in, uh, I joined User Testing. They are a remote user testing and research tool based out in California and opened an Edinburgh office here last year. Um, we'll touch more on that in a bit, joined as a product manager. So shadows, what on earth are you talking about Harrison? Why have shadows got anything to do with data? So please do bear with me for a few moments. Shadows are everywhere. And particularly if you're in Scotland at the minute as the nights draw in, you're seeing a lot more of them as the sun gets lower, as we're using a lot more light and they're casting shadows everywhere. Uh, and they can represent lots of things. This picture, for example, is you can kind of start to piece together a story and a picture, but it's leaving a lot of things unanswered. Um, is that one person? Is it two people? Are those flowers? Is it a bunch of flowers? Is that in a vase? What's that in front of it? There's a lot of questions left open to us and it's open to our own interpretation. Um, some shadows can be a bit scary and a bit mysterious uh, and a bit nerve wracking. Like what, what's going on here? Is, is this person okay? Uh, are they trying to get to us? There's many ways that that could be interpreted and that story is just not that clear. Some of them are just funny. Like we know there's a cat there, but we're again, our brains kind of piecing together lots of different parts of what we've known before, what we've experienced uh, and building up a picture in our brain. Um, I'm pretty sure those are not actual cat size, but we're piecing that together in our mind's eye. And then we just have some classics, like the shadow puppet. It might have been a while since you've tried to do one of these, but I hope you will try it after watching this um, with the light somewhere near you. But this is something we've all seen before. It's someone creating a shadow to misdirect, to be playful, uh, and to probably entertain someone. We know what's creating it, but there's a lot of things we don't know about what's creating that shadow. Ultimately, shadows lose information. It's not telling you everything about what's going on. It's telling you something, but it's not the whole picture. When we look behind the scenes, we can see that this hand, or these set of hands, is creating that shadow puppet. But there's still a lot of things we don't know about that individual from the shadow. You know, who are they? What are they doing? Are they enjoying themselves? Uh, are they acting? Um, how old are they? There's just so many questions we don't know about that person who's creating a puppet. To kind of stretch the metaphor, data can be quite similar. You're losing information by recording something. Just because I make a note of it, log it, create a chart or a table, doesn't give me the full picture about why someone was using your product, uh, working with your business, or, or doing something with your website can get us a long, long way, but it's never going to quite give you the full picture. To stretch this even further, if you look at the wall now, let's just imagine the chart on the wall is your shadow puppet. There are so many things behind the scenes creating those metrics, creating those charts, people's decisions, their environment, their relationships. What is going on in a person's mind when they've decided to buy your product, go to your website, or use your app? the metrics aren't going to give you that full picture all the time. So let's take a step back from the metaphor for a second. Here is a pretty normal e-commerce checkout flow. Someone's going to search for some products. They're going to browse. They're going to add it to a basket. And ultimately, they're hopefully going to check out. There are a million tools out there that will help you build this conversion funnel and help you look at those metrics. But again, 
you don't get the full picture. You can see mechanically what someone is doing on your app or your website, but you don't understand their motivations. Here's a concrete example of that in the real world. Even the biggest of players make mistakes like this sometimes by just relying on data. When Amazon launched in Sweden, um, they got a ton of their translations wrong. Um, so they end up with lewd content, rude words, and somehow inexplicably ending up with the Argentine flag instead of the Swedish one on the product. Those typical e-commerce conversion funnels will have been in place, you can be sure, and they won't have been looking so hot, but I want to give you the full picture as to why something hasn't worked out and they've had to kind of back uh, pedal a little bit to solve that problem. Um, here's an example from Skyscanner. Uh, if you go into Skyscanner today and look at the results page or the day view as it's called internally, you're going to get tons of results for all these flights. So if I want to fly from Edinburgh to Washington, this particular ticket's going to cost me £558. That's the select button. She'll select that flight. Back in the day, this was the book button. A long time ago, everything was about the book button and booking flights. Everything was about making sure that people would do more booking and cl do, click that button more. Um, but when Skyscanner was growing and expanding into new markets, it needed to be internationalized. It needed to be translated. One instance in Italy, fairly infamously, um, it was translated a little too directly and lacked the context. So it ended up with something a bit closer to this more like novel or hardback than book. You can't novel a flight, it's not even a verb. Um, so again, without someone who had the context and the understanding of Italian language, that just didn't work out. The metrics were not going to tell you what was wrong there. Why were people not booking flights in Italy? We had a problem with the context and the data wasn't giving us the full picture. An example um, from Care Sourcer. Care Sourcer's original idea, which is a fantastic one, and they still have it, was about creating um, a product a little similar to Check a Trade or Rated People, where it was about uploading a care request, giving your details in a form, and then real care companies would come back, giving you personalized responses about your care needs. Hey, yeah, we can help you. Here's what it might cost, and here's some specifics about your loved one's needs. Um, when that was first trialed in a hospital, that was incredible because people needed out of hospital there and then. They needed that specific type of information. But when it was opened up to be purely online or more online to acquire users, it wasn't converting anywhere near as well. The metrics were showing that we were struggling to convert people from different traffic sources. And really, we spent ages trying to work this out. And we, we had to take a step back from the metrics to work out what was going on. The reality is that we built a transactional product, whereas our users were using our tool as a research tool. As soon as they got all those responses back from care companies, they were saying, brilliant, thanks so much. That's exactly what I needed to do. I'm going to go off and speak to my family now. They weren't ready to transact. They weren't ready to take it to the next step with those businesses. So we built a transactional product when actually they were using it for research. This ultimately led to a pivot, which is what Care Sourcer looks like today, and it's seen incredible results where it is much more like a typical search product where people can do their research, learn about the sector, learn about the, 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 the whole uh, process of finding care for someone and help them along that journey. That original product is still part of the service, but you're allowing people to do the job that they need to do at the time. The data is never going to tell us that. We had to go and speak to real people to understand what's going on. Let's take a step back. We'll have a gratuitous Bezos quote. Um, the thing I have noticed is that when the anecdotes and the data disagree, the anecdotes are usually right. Amazon is infamously probably one of, if not the most data-driven companies in the world. Again, they leverage it incredibly well, but they don't just rely on it. They still listen to the customers. They still understand what's happening. And once they understand what they need, then they will measure it. And then they will really go to the depths to understand what the data is useful for. I don't know if I would listen to this guy personally, but I did hear this quote somewhere. Um, no, it's me, of course it is. Uh, good data has great context. Let me unpack that for a second. I love data. I think it's an incredibly powerful tool. But data without context is can be quite dangerous. And at, at, at another instance is not very useful at all. 
I can measure how many people log on to an app or a website. I can measure the conversion rates and I can see how many times they come back or when they churn. But if I don't understand why they're doing these things or why they're motivated to do these things, I can't do anything with that data. It's not actionable. When data has context around it, then you can do all those things. If you understand why they're dropping off, if you understand why they're not using your product anymore, you can really start to make those decisions. Data on its own isn't that valuable. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes now thinking about something of a model that might help you through some of these decisions and some of these situations that you're in. Just take a moment to shout out David Hamill, a great member of our product tank community here in Edinburgh many years ago when I was purely data focused and uh, probably a bit naive. David took me to the side more than a few times to enlighten me about the other side of this triangle. So I would say if you've got any challenges relating to uh, user research and you need someone to work with, I highly, highly recommend David Hamill. Back to the model. You can ask your users what they want and what they need, and they're going to tell you. They might tell you what you think they want you to hear, but they will tell you something. You can observe their behavior. You can watch them doing it without bias. That's much harder, but they're not trying to pull the wool over you, your eyes. Um, observation is pretty critical. Um, voting intention is a fantastic example of observation versus asking. People will say things in a poll, but they will, might do something very different when it actually comes to putting the X in a box. So it's important that you're able to do that as well. And then also measure. You can measure things. You can see uh, the view in aggregate. You can count up numbers when you've got sufficient people and you can do all these things. But it's very easy to just rely on measure and not do the other two. It's very easy to buy analytics products, install trackers and build conversion funnels. In fact, it's almost too easy to do that these days. If you overly rely on those things, you won't build up the context to make that data useful uh, and allow you to unlock the real power of using that data. So what can you do? Sorry, excuse me, I'm just gonna move my Zoom window over here so I can see my own slides. And um, if you're early stage, in a company or a product, and I don't mean early stage in terms of startup, but even as a, a product or a process that you're rolling out in a more mature organization, you want to be thinking much more about asking and observing your users. It's a new thing. You don't yet know if it's really what they need, want, or are willing to pay for. You have to be much more biased towards asking and observing them. Again, I'm not saying don't measure and don't use data, but you need to be spending much more of your time finding out what they want and think about it. You don't have enough numbers yet to be measuring. You don't have a critical mass of people to make measuring tools really useful. So in your early stage, you want to be asking and observing more. As you begin to scale, you can increasingly measure. You've figured out a lot of the context. You've got validation, stuff's working. You've got a larger customer base or user base. Fantastic, really start to lean into those measuring tools and processes that you've got. With that context, you can rely on your metrics, you can rely on your funnels because you understand what's going on. If you do that too early, you might miss the point. You miss the context. You miss what people are really, really looking for. Something's gone wrong, something not quite lining up with your expectations, start to shift back to ask and observe. If those trend lines are jumping all over the place or you can't explain something with your existing measurements, you want to shift the focus and the weight of your activities back to ask and observe. You might not have instrumented your product or business well enough to understand a new thing, a new phenomenon, or why they've changed their behavior. And um, there's a huge viral elephant in the room, which we've had some good news about today, by the way. But you know, COVID has completely transformed how most people live their lives from top to bottom. I highly doubt there are many businesses that had enough instrumentation and data in place to fully grasp what the implications were for their products and businesses with data alone. We have to be able to shift back to ask and observe when these big seismic shifts happen and the way people operate. Once you've understood the context again and recalibrated yourself, yeah, we can do more measuring, but for something like COVID, we're just not really going to be able to rely on data alone. As I say, I work for user testing, so it would be remiss not to mention how something like user testing can help in these situations. This will just be very short, but user testing is a remote research tool and user testing tool. 
it's something that really helps with that ask and observe question. You don't have to just rely on numbers. You can go and speak to real people like this, find out what they're thinking and use that to gain context. And this is a screenshot I took from my instance of the app. And this is the type of content you're gonna get back if you use user testing. This is a screen recording of someone looking at a website it's for a company my wife works for, but you're gonna get a real person navigating the site, talking and speaking their thoughts out loud and telling you what they think about your product or your app. Um, great feature that was just launched this year. We've got some sentiment analysis here, even along the bottom where you can jump straight to where they've had a positive or negative sentiment about your product. That's really powerful. But what I find most useful is you're gonna get results within two hours. If I launch a study on user testing, most of our tests come back completed within two hours. You're now organizing user research in an afternoon, not weeks. In previous roles, it's been tough to write a research plan, recruit participants, get them in the room, do the research, distill the information. You can do all that in a day rather than sort of two, three, four weeks that it can traditionally take to get those insights. That massively increases your ability to iterate, do that ask and observe piece and not just rely on your numbers. Um, we also shipped a great product this year called Quick Answers. It does exactly what it says in the tin. All you have to do is type in a phrase that you want people to talk about and we'll automatically launch a study for you written by our internal research team about that topic. COVID impact on behavior studies have been fantastic for a lot of our customers. They've literally been able to throw in something like grocery shopping or library usage, and they'll get those videos back of people discussing the topic, discussing the change um, for them to watch it. It's been a brilliant tool. So we're only plenty of time for questions. So we're going to wrap up. Back to shadows. They're everywhere. They can be a bit misleading. And back to the metaphor, data can be quite similar. It's incredibly powerful but without the right context, it can be very, very misleading. Always be thinking about what is actually driving that data. What's behind the scenes? What emotions, decision-making, relationship questions have your users got as they're using your product and website? And when you bring those two together, you really get the power of data and you're not just being lost in the shadows. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Love to hear any questions. Thank you so much, Harrison. That was brilliant. Definitely ending our 2020 year on a high. Um, I'll, I'll kick off the questions and then I'll hand over to Meg to facilitate further. But um, would you have any tips for a business that maybe what's their, what's their step one if a business hasn't had any kind of experience with this? What would be your step one advice? Yeah, for sure. I think the um, the first thing is that you need to understand where your customers are, who your customers might be. Um, you'll have an idea if you're an existing business or if you haven't done it for a while, but really take a step back and understand who, who are we selling to and why are we selling to them? What are they using us for in the first place? You don't need to use heavy tools initially, but if you have something as simple as a CRM database or records of people that bought from you before, like, can you just email them? Can you, you speak to them? Can you just begin a conversation around what people are thinking? And as you start to learn a bit more, build up uh, more rigor and more process around your user research tooling um, so that you can sort of nicely shift back and forward to focus on more measurement or more ask and observe when you're, when you're ready to. Great. Thanks, Harrison. Um, so I'll start off with the Q&A that's going on in the chat box here. Um, if you do have any questions, pop them in as we're going along and we'll see how many we can get through. Um, David Hamill's also helped by jumping in and help explain some of the questions already. So um, the first question, um, I think you already answered. So um, Ishvak was asking um, if the user testing um, does product work on flat prototypes or whether they have to be full websites or pages. So David jumped in to say you can use prototypes if they're hosted online, but I wasn't sure if you wanted to add any other context to that, Harrison. Yeah, um, absolutely, you absolutely can. Um, a lot of our customers are using prototyping tools like Sketch or Figma or the like, and you can upload uh, a URL from the likes of Figma in the preview state and ask people to step through that prototype and talk through it. You don't need a fully fledged product in that sense. You can also upload app IPK files for the App Store and the equivalent for Google Play. So you can preview apps before they've been launched to the public as well. 
Awesome, thanks. I think that also answers your question as well, Ross, on testing of apps and user testing. So we'll skip past that one. Um, next question is from uh, Kate. Um, she's asking, is there not a danger that you can end up interviewing the wrong type of person as part of your research? And what are your thoughts on getting feedback from someone that will never buy your product? Um, great question. Short answer, yes, definitely uh, a possibility. I think that's kind of part of where the art of it comes into that um, you can speak to as many people as you want, but until they, they do start using it or paying for it, it's, it's going to be tough to know who the customer is going to be at the end. Um, that is part of the art and something I'm continually learning about as I'm working in this space and making that shift more from data to product management. Um, it's, people can say whatever they want, and it's back to that ask-observe piece on the triangle. You can ask some, somebody a question, but until they actually carry out the action or put the money on the table and um, talk is cheap. That's a bit of a cliche. Um, and part of that will be making sure as you're designing your user research plans, making sure that you're aware of that and figuring out what dimensions you need to be watching out for. Is it a certain persona, grouping of people or stage of buyer that may just never be a buyer and that's okay. And how do you learn that as quickly as possible? Awesome, thanks. Um, a great question here from Dwayne as well about the ask, measure, observe triangle. Um, so he was asking if the goal is to be in the middle at all times or whether you would shift towards one activity or the other based on a need um, at any time. For example, should you be mainly be doing one of these activities at any one time? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I, said, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take that too literally. Um, it's more like just a mental model to help you work with it. But yeah, ideally you want to be you don't want to be one extreme at any one point in time, but uh, as something matures and you're pretty sure how things work and you've built up pretty robust context around it, you could be pretty close to the measure if you wanted to. And um, I think one thing is worth taking away is that it's kind of as an organization or an individual, your ability to rebalance yourself. Um, if you go too far in on measure, but don't have ways of reaching out to your users or good habits or cadences of doing that, it becomes quite difficult to make that shift, to make that shift of weight as it were. And um, COVID as an example, when something like that lands and lockdown pretty much hits overnight, how, um, how much agility do you as an organization have to shift away from your measurement stance? Do you have user research practices in place already? Do you have ways of speaking to your customers already? Or are you going to be on a cold start suddenly panicking like, gosh, none of our numbers make sense anymore. None of our measurement works. We need to shift back to that. So I, I wouldn't focus too much. Balance is good. And there will be times when you'll shift your weight to other areas of focus. But um, as a takeaway, probably ask yourself, if I had to go away and re, uh, speak to a user this afternoon, how easy it is for me to do that? And how would I even do that? Great advice. Thanks. Um, Next question is from uh, Caspian. Um, he's asking, uh, how would you handle much broader questions such as site-wide UI refreshes alongside AB data and where or if does that fit into the triangle? Yeah, great question. Um, we'll tackle the AB testing first. Um, AB testing is a great tool in the right context. Um, AB testing is about measuring the size of impact uh, on something that you can already measure. There's, there's tons of great work out there about how to run A-B tests and do power analysis and calculation, calculations and all the rest of it. Um, A-B testing is great when you have to defend something or getting it wrong is really dangerous. You think about the origins of A-B testing, it was really the medical community and the scientific community that came up with that for randomized controlled trials. There was huge downside if those trials went wrong, they had to get it right. Um, so having specificity uh, and power calculations and all the rest of that was really, really necessary. Um, my counter to that is A-B testings or A-B tests, I should say, are very tiresome to set up because they can go wrong in so many ways and they can take a long time, probably a minimum of a week, two weeks to get a full business cycle in there. I would flip the question to say, what are you actually trying to achieve? And is there a better way of getting that answer with that two week period of time? Do you need an A-B test because you're defending like a really important revenue stream? Or could you use that two weeks to put um, five or six different prototypes of a new idea in front of 20 different users? 
And if you're at that stage of the process, I guarantee speaking to more users and putting more ideas in front of them in two weeks is going to get you further forward than running that A-B test. Because if you run the A-B test and it turns out to be inconclusive or invalid, you've lost those two weeks. So you need to be really certain you're going to get an answer if you're going to use an A-B test or it's critical to your business. Site-wide UI freshes, like they're tough. It's hard to measure that because you can't necessarily get a baseline unless you can really put genuinely put 50% of your users on one version or the other. That's pretty weird and it's hard to do. Um, I haven't seen a great way of doing it, to be honest. Often for things like that, you just have to take the plunge, particularly with app redesigns. You're always going to get some negative user pushback because people are creatures of habit. Um, Again, there's a lot of great content out there about those types of redesigns and refreshes. I'm not going to say I have the, the final word on that by any means. Yeah, I'd encourage people to go and have a Google around for that one. Great advice again, thanks. And um, we'll round off with just one last question. Um, Stephen Clark's kind of given some comments as well as a question about user testing. So he's saying that data is both quant and qual in nature and um, mm -hmm. with both types of data helping us validate hypotheses. Uh, grounding yourself in the hypothesis that you need to validate the risk that you need to reduce is key to being able to understand and use the data most effectively. So mm -hmm. on that, have you got any plans for user testing to expand to become more of a research platform and to capture insights from multiple sources of data and to show how they're reducing risk by helping validate hypothesis and assumptions about customers and products? Great. Well done for getting all that out, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's tons of plans in the pipeline for user testing. I think we um, recently acquired um, a product for card and tree sorting. So it seems point there are many different ways of acquiring this data and types of data. And we're bringing that to market quite soon. Um, one of our strategies has been to kind of partner with more of the quant side as well to like leverage great quantitative testing um, together with um, the more user research side. Um, yeah, I think we user testing would love to be in that place that we want. We want to be in a position where we are, where you can do all of your user research. There's a long way off that, but we recognize that our strength is in the qualitative side as an organization. That's where our strengths really, really lie. And um, what we really would love to do and for the future of user testing is how can we help your entire organization become leveraging these types of research tools and quantitative tests. Um, if you, it's not just a single designer or a single product manager, how can an entire division rely on our tools to make the right calls? It's really something quite powerful going on with some of our other co customers where their entire customer service divisions are leveraging user testing to test um, support flows and content on their support platforms. And as they roll out entire processes in their business, they're using user testing and research driven approaches to that development, not just small little product features or rollouts of apps, the scope to uh, do your whole business um, with this kind of insight. I think that's really powerful and exciting.